Try to get comfortable. Sit with your back comfortably straight. If you're bending over, it's going to cause a lot of pressure on your back. And be comfortable with your breath. Find the breath sensations in the body that feel comfortable and stick with them. Allow them to stay there. And as that sense of comfort begins to grow, be careful not to get sucked into it too much. Try to maintain your mindfulness and your alertness so the mind doesn't start drifting off. That's one of our problems. We get a little bit of pleasure, a little bit of comfort, and we let go. Just wallow in the pleasure. Forget where we are. Forget what we're doing. And as a result, the pleasure goes away, because the causes that are going to bring it, keep it there, get dropped. The mindfulness, the alertness, the ardency of your effort to stick with it weaken. And when they weaken, so, that, so does the sense of pleasure. So try to keep alert. One way, as soon as there is a sense of pleasure, try to be aware of the whole body. And keep that awareness going. You find that it's not as easy as it sounds, because the mind has a habitual tendency to shrink. So keep reminding yourself, whole body breathing in, whole body breathing out. And the amount of mindfulness and alertness that are required to keep that whole body awareness going will keep you awake, keep you alert, as long as you maintain them. This is one very immediate, very visceral way of showing goodwill to yourself, providing yourself with a sense of pleasure and ease. Because when you think about it, this is about everything we do. Is based on the pleasure principle, trying to maximize pleasure and minimize suffering. We've come to the meditation because we've found that other ways, other strategies we have of pursuing the pleasure principle haven't worked or are not working well enough for us. This is why the Buddha points his teachings at the issue of suffering and the end of suffering. Because these are the big issues in our lives. And there's a lot of bewilderment that surrounds them. As the Buddha said, that's, that's our reaction to suffering. It's one, bewilderment, and two, search for someone to show us a way out of the suffering. This is why it's important for the Buddha to put so much emphasis on who you hang around with, who you associate with, who you look to for your advice. Because they can set you on the right path to the end of suffering, or they can set you on all kinds of wrong paths. This is why you have to be very careful. We would like to think that all paths lead up to the top of the mountain. I don't know any mountain in the world where, where that principle works. There are a lot of paths that lead away from the top of the mountain. We have to be very careful about which path we choose. Even the whole principle, all rivers lead to the ocean, they don't all lead to the ocean. Think of the rivers that end up in the Great Basin. They just dry up. So you have to be careful who you hang around with and what kind of strategies you apply for try finding happiness, a happiness that's lasting. The Buddha said this is the beginning of wisdom, when you find wise people and you ask them, what when I do it will be for my long-term welfare and happiness. And then you reflect on their answers, you compare them to the strategies you've been pursuing, and you see what's worth giving a try. Because a lot of our strategies work to some extent. If they didn't work at all, we would have discarded them. But the Buddha saw that a lot of our strategies don't work as well as they could. For example, there's a habitual strategy to avoid even thinking about suffering, doing anything you can to put it out of your mind. The idea being that if you don't think about it, don't pay any attention, if you can ignore it, it'll go away. And there may be a few cases in life where that works, but there's so many cases where it doesn't. It works for a while, and then it breaks down. But because we're used to this approach, used to this strategy, this is why there's a lot of resistance to even listening to the Buddha's first noble truth. This is why 
there's so much misunderstanding about the First Noble Truth as well. People say, well, the Buddha says his life is suffering. Well, that's not true. I don't believe that. There's no place where the Buddha said that life is suffering. But it's amazing to see how many people believe that. But that's not what he said. He simply said, there is suffering in life. And he points out all the obvious sufferings we have. Birth is suffering, all the pain that goes into being born and giving birth. Aging, illness, death, these are all suffering. Being separated from what you like, having to live with what you don't like. It goes all down the list. Finally comes up with the five aggr clinging aggregates of suffering. This is where he starts getting technical. And when he starts attacking another one of our common strategies which is our sense of self. This is one of the Buddha's great insights, is that our sense of self is an activity and it's a strategy for avoiding suffering, for maximizing happiness. We latch on to certain things and say, well, this is me. This is what I have to watch out for. As long as I watch out for this, maximize the happiness of this thing, the well-being of this thing, that'll take care of me. It's an activity. It's a strategy. It works to some extent, but then there are areas where it breaks down. Because the things we latch on to are all impermanent. No matter how much we try to dress them up, fix them up, keep them going, they all ultimately break down. Form, feeling, perception, thought constructs, even sensory consciousness. But we're strongly addicted to this approach, which is why we, again, we spend so much time misinterpreting what the Buddha had to say. The Buddha says there is no self. Well, that can't be right. We don't look at what he's actually saying. He's saying, your sense of self is a strategy, an attempt you make to maximize happiness and minimize suffering. And to some extent it works. I mean, he actually has you use a sense of self as part of his teachings, teaching you to be self-reliant, to look after your true self-interest, in other words, your long-term welfare and happiness. His teachings on generosity, virtue, the development of goodwill, all the things that come under the category of merit. Basically take your sense of self, the sense of a continuing identity, not only in this lifetime but also into other lifetimes. So as you take that sense of self, and this is how you work with it intelligently, so that you're not causing harm to yourself, not causing harm to other people. You're creating the conditions for happiness in this world and on into the next. He also uses the development of goodwill, immeasurable go goodwill, compassion, appreciation, and equanimity to clean up one of the major problems we have in a sense of self, and that's our sense of responsibility, knowing that in the past we've done things that are not all that good, and taking care of our fear of the consequences of those unskillful actions. He says, don't. Let yourself get tied up in remorse. Focus on the present moment, and at the same time develop attitudes of limitless goodwill, because within a mind like that, the impact of past bad actions gets weaker and weaker, the more limitless your goodwill and compassion, equanimity and appreciation can be. So in all these cases, giving, virtue, the development of goodwill. He takes your sense of self and tries to get you to use it intelligently. That is a strategy for maximizing happiness. Ultimately, though, self as a strategy can only go so far. And this is where the strategy on not-self comes in, where as you look at the various things you hold on to, these, this activity of creating a me or a mind. So exactly what are you creating it out of? Look at the raw materials, and you see that they can't possibly be you or can't possibly provide true happiness in the ultimate sense, because they are so unstable and inconstant. They're all stressful because they're all fabricated. They're, made, they're intentional. And intentions are inconstant. When the cause is inconstant, how can the result be constant? And this analysis goes against the grain. But hopefully by the time that we've been practicing the Buddha's teachings, especially the ones in generosity, virtue, and goodwill, our sense of our 
standards for what counts as true happiness get more refined, particularly as we develop our powers of concentration and get used to more and more refined sense of ease, more expansive sense of ease. We get more discriminating in our tastes, our appreciation for what true happiness could be. And there comes a point where we're willing to incline our minds and say, well, maybe the Buddha's right. Maybe if you let go of these things, we won't be burdened by them. This is what the not-self strategy is all about, learning how to let go of the things that we hold really tight. So it takes us step by step, starting with our normal desire for true happiness. It says, focus on the happiness, focus on what needs to be done for happiness. But also be aware of the limitations. As you get more sensitive to what those limitations are, it can incline your mind to want something more refined. That's where he offers you more refined techniques, more refined strategies. So in that sense, it's a, it's a seamless practice. But when we're on the practice, it doesn't seem seamless. Our minds go back and forth. Seeming to advance for a while, then retreat, and advance and retreat, and then go left and right and all over the place. Because some of the Buddhist strategies go so against our old habits, the mind tends to rebel. So we've got to learn how to be patient with it. As with anybody overcoming addiction, there are going to be ups and downs. But if you're patient enough and sensitive enough, rely on your powers of perseverance, you find that they see you through. Because after all, we really do want true happiness. It's not an artificially induced desire. It's something that underlies all our action. What we're doing as we're practicing is putting the mind in a position where it has a better and better chance of gaining the kind of maturity that's finally willing to give the Buddha's approaches a try, to replace our old strategies, which have some extent of success but not total, but to which we're so attached. Learning how to pry loose our attachment to those old strategies so we can try something that's initially counterintuitive. But as you get more and more sensitive on it, they make, the Buddha's approaches make more and more sense. And that they really do give results, the promised results, a happiness that's unconditioned. Because that's the only kind of happiness that can last. Conditions. Where do conditions come from? Well, ultimately, they come from our intentions. And what are intentions like? Well, you've seen your intentions. They go up and down. Even when you try to make them constant in concentration, you find that even in those refined states of concentration, they're still an up and down. And this way the Buddha has you cornered. You let go of the grosser forms of happiness, the grosser strategies for happiness, and get used to more and more refined ones. And they finally take you to the point where there's nothing but no course left but to let go of the strategies. And that's when you see that what the Buddha taught was right. He really knew what he was talking about. This is the way to true happiness. <laughs>